Let's say you're unlucky enough to live in a part of the world where Al Qaeda has come in and decided to take over your town. Let's say one of the branches of Al Qaeda somewhere in the world has decided that your town is going to be their new home base. They're going to set up a new Al Qaeda state there. However, lucky for you, turns out it doesn't work out for them. And one night in the middle of the night, all the Al Qaeda guys get up and take off. They realize that their plan for your town, it's not working out for some reason. Maybe they fear they're about to be attacked or something. Maybe they just get an idea that they'd rather take over somewhere else. But for whatever reason, in short order, they bug out, leaving all of their Al Qaeda junk behind in their Al Qaeda house. Here's the question. Who gets all their Al Qaeda junk? Who gets all their paperwork, including like Al Qaeda manifestos and logistic stuff and Al Qaeda job applications and their receipts and expenses? What happens to all that stuff left behind once Al Qaeda flees in the middle of the night? Well, when that did happen in Timbuktu in Mali in January 2013, the person who got all that stuff was a freaking excellent reporter named Rukmini Kalamaki, who then worked for the AP and who now works for the New York Times. And her beat for years now has been international Islamic extremism, specifically terrorist groups like Al-Qaeda and now ISIS. You might remember a story from a couple of years ago about Al-Qaeda having one particularly terrible employee in West Africa. Remember the story about his, how his bosses sent him a scathing letter describing how he just wasn't answering the phone when they called, he didn't turn in his expense reports, he was ignoring meetings, he wasn't following Al-Qaeda instructions, and most of all, they were very upset with him for failing to carry out any single spectacular terrorist operations. In response to that criticism, he stormed out, he quit. He cut ties with Al-Qaeda International and formed his own sort of competing terrorist group. I mean, whatever you think about that guy as a terrorist, when you're Al-Qaeda, that guy's a bad employee. That incredible tale was Rukmini Kalamaki's story. She recovered that letter about that bad employee from those Al-Qaeda documents that she found in Mali. You might also remember the story about how Al-Qaeda and its affiliates are being bankrolled by ransom payments made to them mainly by European governments, even though those governments vehemently deny those allegations. The piece reports that since 2008, Al-Qaeda has made over $100 million in revenue off of ransom payments for hostages. That, too, was Rukhmini Kalamaki's story. Then there was the piece the week after the Charlie Hebdo attack, the piece that systematically detailed how the two brothers behind that attack evolved from amateur, wannabe, lousy, pitiful terrorists into fully radicalized, skilled killers over a period of years under the eyes of European authorities. That was Rukhmini Kalamaki's story. Earlier this month, there was a devastating, gut-wrenching story on ISIS's sex slaves that included interviews from more than three dozen Yazidi women and girls who had escaped ISIS's capture and then described how they were forced to take birth control and how ISIS fighters went to great lengths to make sure that they avoided pregnancy as they were raped systematically as sex slaves. That was Rukmini Kalamaki's story. And now today, the New York Times has broken another one of these incredible, granular, super specific, I can't believe we know this stories by the same reporter, by Rukmini Kalamaki. And this time, it is the stuff of nightmares for real. This time, is it, it's about how ISIS operates the specific part of their organization that isn't preoccupied with fighting Assad in Syria or governing Mosul in Iraq or blowing up priceless world antiquities in Palmyra or executing religious minorities and journalists and hostages in any of the territory that ISIS controls. No, what she has been able to document is the specific part of that organization that exists purely to kill people outside of the territory that ISIS controls and specifically to kill people in Europe and the West. And when I say specific, I mean specific. She has just reported the name of the software that these guys have been given by ISIS to delete their whole online history from any computer that they work on. She's reported the name of the software that they use to encrypt their communications. She's described the apartment building that has been set up in ISIS-controlled territory in Raqqa in Syria basically as a dorm specifically for these ISIS trainees who are about to be sent back into Europe to commit terrorist attacks in Europe. She reports the name of the senior official in ISIS who oversees this external operations bureau. 
He's basically the minister of propaganda for ISIS. He's already got a $5 million price on his head by the U.S. Rewards for Justice program. But in addition to him, she also reports on the guy under him who basically ran the program, who operationally personally ran the program to send ISIS fighters into Europe specifically to go shoot people in Europe and blow things up in Europe. She reports his name. She reports his driving habits. She reports the way he recruited people, how he treated them once he recruited them, who he was happy with, who he was disappointed in. She reports the nickname that he gave his recruits to use for him when they contacted him by cell phone or by code or by encrypted communication. Turns out what he wanted them to call him was dad. And, and by the way, that's not like a word that means something else in Arabic. It just dad. Ugh. So there's only uh, two pieces of good news here. One, uh, this guy running the European branch of this external operations bureau for ISIS, this guy in charge of recruiting and training ISIS fighters specifically to leave Iraq and Syria, go back to Europe and commit terrorist attacks there. One piece of good news here is that he is believed to be dead. He is one of the guys believed to have been killed in Paris. The other piece of good news here is that there is a reporter now at the New York Times who is doing work this granular and this fascinating, and she's here uh, tonight for the interview. Rukmini Kalamaki is a foreign correspondent for The Times. Um, I hope I didn't embarrass you. Thank you for being <laughs> Thank here. Thank you so much for having me, Rachel. Um, so let's talk about this newest scoop that you've got. Um, it seems like what you've got access to, which nobody else had been able to report on before, at least in the Western media, mm -hmm. was interrogation reports and intelligence documents from European security agencies. I don't want to ask you how, how you got those things, sure. but what is so telling about that kind of documentation that lets you tell this stuff in such granular detail? Sure. Let me just add that uh, Le Monde newspaper was able to get some of the same interrogation records as me, as mm -hmm. did CNN, so I don't want to claim as if I'm the first one to have gotten uh, this, this entire pile. What I have done is I think I, is I've brought new analysis uh, to it. And what, what we're seeing is that the accepted wisdom on ISIS uh, was that unlike Al-Qaeda, they were interested in holding territory and in governing. Building whereas, a state. And right. building a state, exactly. Whereas Al-Qaeda was interested in, in, in hitting the West. And in fact, that's wrong. It was never binary. It was always a, a question of both. Uh, as of two years ago, so two years before the Brussels attack, ISIS was already sending operatives uh, back to Europe. The very first data point that I have is a guy called Ibrahim Boudina, who leaves ISIS held territory after having been trained there, including in how to make a bomb with TATP, this dangerous explosive. He leaves in December of 2013, is arrested in February of 2014. Now, we don't know for sure, was he sent by ISIS or did he come of his own, of, of his own volition? But very soon after him, there's another guy called Mehdi Namouche. This man goes on to attack the Brussels Jewish Museum. Mm -hmm. At the time, we're told that he was acting alone. In fact, the documents that I have now show that he was in direct contact. He has a 20-minute telephone call before those attacks with Abdel Hamid Abaoud, who was the architect of, uh, architect of the Paris attacks. So he's not operating on his own terms. Not he has been dispatched by ISIS Central in Iraq and Syria to do this in Belgium. Exactly. And this, the second piece of data on that is he is re his when he's arrested, his mugshot is all over Europe. Nicolas Enna, who was one of the French hostages who was chained to James Foley, the, the American reporter that is beheaded by ISIS, immediately recognizes him as one of the people who tortured him. Mm. The hostages were a very precious resource for ISIS. They were getting millions of euros for the Europeans, and they were getting a very big propaganda hit for killing the Americans. Not everybody has access to those hostages. This is a man who not only had access as far as guarding them, but was allowed to torture one of them. So he's not just anybody in, uh, in ISIS. And yet, that is what European officials told us at the moment of his capture in, in May of 2014. And we go on. Um, I was able to document 21 people. These are Europeans, almost all of them French and Belgians, who leave Europe, go to, go to Syria, train under ISIS, in many, in many instances commit atrocities under ISIS, then come back. They real infiltrate Europe. Europe. Some of them are actually on, on commercial flights. They're not, they're not even com coming through the refugee route, through the most mundane of means. They're able to return to Europe, and they try to commit plots in Europe. Luckily, most of them are stopped. Uh, but yet, this arc of these people coming back roughly every two months was just missed. It, we, 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 we describe Paris as somehow a change in strategy in ISIS. It was not a change in strategy. It's been going on for at least two years. Is it actually good news that the man who you identify as the head of 
basically ISIS's external operations bureau, specifically to dispatch fighters to Europe, mm -hmm. uh, that we believe he's dead. Is that good news in terms of this being a capacity of the organization? It, it's always it's always a good thing when one of these operatives is taken out. But let's go back to Osama bin Laden. When bin Laden is killed, we were told that we were told that Al Qaeda has been degraded, that Al Qaeda is now in shambles, that it's falling apart. It wasn't true. Al Qaeda is still here today. Just a couple of weeks ago, they did the attack on the Grand Bassam uh, resort in Ivory Coast. Just before that, they did an attack on the splendid hotel in Burkina Faso. These are places that I know because I spent a lot of time in Africa, so it's quite personal to me. And before that, on the Radisson Blue. So they've had, you know, this is a group that we were told was was degraded after the head was killed, after the head of the, certain, the serpent was cut off. And the way these organizations have been built uh, is, is in this very organic manner. Uh, it's created in a way that it regenerates itself as, as soon as a leader is taken out. And it's uh, us understanding their regenerative capacity and the way that they adapt to the pressure they're under. Um, it's scary, but I feel like it actually makes me feel better to understand more about how they operate uh, than to be uh, I, I'm happy to be informed and afraid rather than ignorant and afraid. Uh, and a big part of that is because you do such good reporting on this. Thank you. Uh, thank you for thank doing you. this work. Thank, thank you. you. I'm really touched. Rukmini Kalamaki is a foreign correspondent uh, for The New York Times. And uh, The New York Times is smart to have her. <laughs> we'll be right back. Stay with us. Hey there, I'm Chris Hayes from MSNBC. Thanks for watching MSNBC on YouTube. If you want to keep up to date with the videos we're putting out, you can click subscribe just below me or click over on this list to see lots of other great videos.